Okay, now let's look at the theoretical sampling distribution of the sample proportion and its estimates based on a single sample, how to estimate that. So in the previous section, we reviewed the simulations that resulted in estimates of what's formally called the sampling distribution of a sample proportion. And again, just like with, with means, the sampling distribution of a sample proportion is a theoretical probability distribution. It describes the distribution of all sample proportions from all possible random samples of the same size taken from a population. And again, we're never going to take more than one sample. So these simulations, while useful to illustrate a concept, are not how we're going to actually do real research. But luckily, the central limit theorem plays a role with binary outcomes as well. And the central limit theorem has already proven itself as a powerful mathematical tool, but will add to its sexiness here. And it gives a couple useful results about proportions. The central limit theorem tells us that the sampling distribution of sample proportions based on all samples of the same size n will be approximately normal. The mean of all sample proportions in the sampling distribution would be the true proportion in the population from which the samples were taken, what we'll represent with a p without a hat. And the standard deviation of the sample proportions of size n is equal to the square root of p times 1 minus p over n. This is something given to us by the central limit theorem, and we'll see if it's a good fit to our estimated sampling distributions in a minute. And this is often called the standard error of the sample proportion, and sometimes written as sc p hat. So recall the population distribution of individuals' insurance status, the true proportion was 80% or 0.8. And now I'm going to show you the results of what we just did. And then I also did an additional set of simulations where I took 5,000 random samples for each sample size consideration and did the same study. So you can see in the first, the second and third columns show the mean of the 500 sample proportions and the 5,000 sample proportions that I didn't show you before for the different sample size choices. And you can see that these means all vacillate around the true proportion of 0.8 or 80%. Then in the fourth and fifth columns, we have the sample standard deviation of the 500 sample proportions and then the 5,000 sample proportions, respectively, for each sample size choice. And you can see that within each sample size choice, these standard deviations are similar, whether we took 500 samples or 5,000. And additionally, they're similar to what would be predicted by the central limit theorem by employing that formula we just looked at. So the central limit theorem tells us the following. When taking a random sample of binary outcomes of size n from a population where the true proportion of operations with the outcome is p, the theoretical sampling distribution of sample proportions from all possible random samples of size n is given by a normal curve centered at the true proportion and the spread in the normal curve described by the standard error is given by that formula. So again, what good is this info? It's the same exact logic we saw with means. While well, using properties normal curve, we know that most random samples we could take, 95% of the samples we could take, that our sample proportion will fall within two standard errors of the true proportion. So again, we're, we're only going to take one sample ever sample size n, and we're going to get one sample proportion, one p hat. So we're not going to know p, and of course if we did know p, why would we care about p hats? But we are going to take a single sample size n and get one p hat, but for most of the single samples we can get, our p hat will fall within plus or minus two standard errors of p, and by most I mean 95 percent. So, if we do take a single sample, estimate one sample proportion, if we go two standard errors in either direction, we'll create an inter interval that 95% of the time will contain the true proportion. For 95% of the studies we could do, if we take this approach, create this interval, we'll capture the true proportion. And such an interval is called a 95% confidence interval for the population proportion P. And the interval is given by p hat plus or minus two standard errors of p hat, or p hat 
plus or minus 2 times the square root of p times 1 minus p over n. The problem is we don't know p. So how do we deal with the standard error? Well, we can estimate with p hat, and we'll deal with that in the next section. What's the uh, interpretation of the confidence interval for a population proportion? Well, it's the same interpretation as we had for means. It gives a range of plausible values for the true proportion using the results from one single imperfect subsample of that population. The researcher can never observe the true proportion. P hat is the best estimate based on a single sample, and the 95% confidence interval starts with this best estimate and then additionally recognizes uncertainty in the quantity. Technically speaking, again, if we had done 100 random samples of size n taken from the same population and 95% confidence intervals were computed using each of these 100 samples, 95 of the inter 100 intervals would contain the value of the true proportion p within their endpoints. And again, these are only counting for random sampling error. Confidence intervals only account for random sampling error, not other systematic sources of error or bias. And again, we can compute confidence intervals other than 95% if we adjust the number of standard errors we add and subtract from p hat. So just to summarize what we saw in this set of examples, we saw a couple of trends. Distribution of sample proportions tended to be approximately normal even when the original individual level data was not. And of course, with a binary outcome that only takes on two values, it can't be. The individual level data is only a yes or a no, a one or a zero. It cannot be normally distributed. And we saw that the variability in the sample proportion values decreased as the size of the sample each proportion was based on increased. And as with continuous data and means, the variation in our sample proportion values is tied to the size of each sample selected in the exercises, not to the number of samples. Number of samples was just arbitrary and it was used to estimate the sampling distribution, but the number of samples itself does not impact the variability systematically.